What's up, beautiful humans? I'm excited for you to check out this clip with my friend Jeff Brown. If you've ever gone through heartbreak or going through heartbreak, or probably will, this is going to help you. Enjoy this clip. The assumption, because we're carrying so much shame as individuals and a collective, that it's about us, that it's a reflection of our value, is the biggest part of the problem. I mean, if we could let go of that, if we could carry the belief that we have intrinsic value, we'd actually be capable of seeing the other in their humanity and not personalizing the experience. Welcome to the Feeling Free Podcast. My name is Ben Harris, also known as the Fear Guy. My job is to help you feel more free in your life with the love and relationships, self-worth, and much more. I'm happy you're here. I love you. I believe in you. Let's break free from fear together. Please welcome Jeff Brown, best-selling author of six books. Man, I'm really excited for you guys to hear this conversation with Jeff because if you've ever been through a painful heartbreak, this is for you. Love is not all you need. It is much more. We discuss psychology, expectations of love, and much more. It's amazing. Enjoy. Alrighty, everyone, welcome to the Feeling Free Podcast. Um, I have Jeff Brown here. And in the intro, I give you a slight overview of his credentials. But one thing that I really love about Jeff is that he doesn't tout his credentials in in some ways. And he owns it. He exemplifies it. So, Jeff, thanks for being here. My pleasure, Ben. Looking forward to talking to you. <laughs> I love it. And, yeah, like, thank you so much for spending your time with us. Because um, you could cover a vast variety of topics but today we're just going to focus on the pain of heartbreak and learning how to love ourselves a bit more and opening our heart and like feeling those feelings and to give you context like what really gave me like what caught my attention like stopped me in my tracks was reading a passage from your book an uncommon bond which you will read from soon page 226 to be exact and like I shared it to my Instagram story and from anything that I've ever reshared that had the biggest response. Um, I had quite a few people just like, wow, thank you for sharing that. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. Like I loved it. And so for me, I just knew that we had to have a conversation around this. And for me, it's eased a lot of my pain and brought me peace that I was feeling because in the past year I've been in two short relationships um and you know there's chemistry compatibility or what seemed like it and i was ready and i was committed but and i was diving in while they were still questioning to come to the pool or not you know <laughs> like they were um and i felt hurt um because nothing was wrong with me and they said ben you're amazing ben you're amazing and but i questioned my worth i'm like if i'm not amazing or if i am amazing why are you not choosing me and so what we're about to go into has brought me a lot of peace of not taking oh, that personally. So great. So let me yeah. read the quote because it gives it. us a good starting point. Let's do it. Okay. Quote, sometimes people walk away from love because it's so beautiful that it terrifies them. Sometimes they leave because the connection shines a bright light on their dark places and they are not ready to work them through. Sometimes they run away because they're not developmentally prepared to merge with another. They have more individuation work to do first. Sometimes they take off because love is not a priority in their lives. They have another path and purpose to walk first. Sometimes they end it because they prefer a relationship that is more practical than conscious, one that does not threaten the ways that they organize reality. Because so many of us carry shame, we have a tendency to personalize love's leavings, triggered by the rejection and feelings of abandonment. But this is not always true. Sometimes it has nothing to do with us. Sometimes the one who leaves is just not ready to hold it safe. Sometimes they know something we don't, 
They know their limits at that moment in time. Real love is no easy path. Readiness is everything. May we grieve loss without personalizing it. May we learn to love ourselves in the absence of the lover. Close quote. So the passage that you just read, it really is. So I've read the quote. Yeah. yeah. So you read. So you read the quote. What What has been your ex- experience? Um, you know, you cover. I think it was in 1998. Believe of your own experience of. So what was that experience that you know led you to? I'm writing this book later in life. Um, I had I met a woman and had what what I would later define and found work around something called an uncommon bond, a very particular type of a powerhouse connection. We define that in the back of the book. Um, and in that experience, the I was pushed to shed my warrior armor. I had always been very much in control in relationship. Mm-hmm. not fully prepared to commit on the deepest levels. And this connection forced me, it was almost like I got my karma up and, you know, it was like I was now forced to be the most deeply vulnerable I'd ever been. Um, and I did. And we went to profound and remarkable places that transformed my whole view of reality. Uh, and then she shattered it um, by being with another person in a reactive fit of, you know, she has, always had her own issues around attachment she was a wonderful door opener but not somebody who could ever keep the door open and i didn't understand all that then i was in this profoundly raw and visceral experience and thereafter had to make a decision as to whether i was going to go back to armor which was so familiar to me or whether i was going to learn how to love this experience forward and find my way to an opening and and i decided after a long period of time and really tussling internally around it to reopen and and to love it forward and that and i became a writer at the end of it because that was really what this was probably all about was getting me to the stage where i was ready to rock and to write and i knew i always would but i hadn't lived enough suffered enough or opened enough or something or learned enough um so i became very intimate with this question both in that experience and in just my own behaviors over the years you know, as to why it is that somebody disconnects. I mean, I would disconnect from wonderful, wonderful women that had nothing, not a single thing about them to, in fact, I probably, in many cases, in fact, definitively disconnected because they were so wonderful. Mm -hmm. I wasn't looking to get lost in something wonderful with somebody else. I was still on a very individuation-based path and or running away from contact or whatever it was. It depended on the person in the moment. But the assumption, because we're carrying so much shame as individuals and a collective, that it's about us, that it's a reflection of our value, is the biggest part of the problem. I mean, if we could let go of that, if we could carry the belief that we have intrinsic value, we'd actually be capable of seeing the other in their humanity and not personalizing the experience. But because we hate ourselves so bloody much, and we've been conditioned to hate ourselves so bloody much, and to personalize everything negative, um, we have a tendency to see everything almost, you know, it's the nature of a narcissistic wound. It's the nature of shame that we see everything as a function or a reflection of us, um, you know, and our, and it's ironic, you know, you're rejected by someone you feel you love, and then you immediately start making everything about you, you know? You didn't love them enough to actually yeah. consider the possibility that some of it had to do with them, it just becomes about you and this is where we're at as a collective um and i think it's a serious problem because you know we then feel rejected we feel armored we defend against contact we stop going back into the relationship laboratory to find our way to what we need and want um and all of it because we've taken personally something that often had absolutely nothing to do with us and even if it did have something to do with us if we love ourselves enough it wouldn't stop us from engage, re-engaging in relationship thereafter. Wow. I mean, that's powerful. And like, do you feel like, I mean, you just pretty much explained the fear of like the armor. So would you kind of relate both of those of like the armor versus like fear of being hurt? Yeah. I mean, I mean, well, some people, you know, carry the fear, but they're able to keep walking into experiences. Yes. Maybe they're more comfortable with getting wounded or with risking themselves than other people are. You know, they're scared, but they keep going. Um, and I'm, um, 
and other people aren't. You know, they're at a very fragile stage when they open. It's a big deal. It's a very hard and challenging thing. Um, and so if it doesn't go well, then they just have more evidence to confirm their belief that they should always stay self-protected. Yeah. And, you know, Ben, we don't learn anything about these things. I mean, like in grade school and high school, and, you know, the most important, probably the two most important things that will affect the direction of our life, which is how we deal with our feelings and how we deal with the relational field, we learn absolutely nothing about them. And we learn everything about things that we oftentimes will never, ever use again in our lives, <laughs> yep. you know? Um, so we end up going out there with no information, with nobody before us who really knew much. There are very few real love elders out there. You know, this mm -hmm. book, Uncommon Bond, is a call to love eldership in many ways, but mm -hmm. there's so few people out there. There are either a lot of psychotherapists who can work in the relational field but don't understand the spiritual component of some connections, or there's, you know, twin flamey people who don't have any understanding <laughs> of the psychological roots of anything. So mm -hmm. what we need are people who combine both of those things and can yes. work in both aspects of relationship and bring them together as one. And we don't have that. So people end up getting rejected and it could have, I mean, I can list a number of people I was connected to early in my life that I disconnected from. It had nothing to do with their value or merit. It had to do with where I was at. It had to do with what I wanted to do next. It had to do with my being afraid of the feelings. Mm -hmm. It had to do with so many other things in the flow of my life. But people took it personally. And um, it's a big mistake. Yeah. And I love how you say... Um that we personalize the negative, quote unquote, and then we depersonalize the positive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that happens all the time, right? <laughs> right. You know, but that's part of being a shame collective. That's part of being a shame collective. We're, you know, we're, we, we were taught, you know, in, in the mainstream world, if you got too, they call it full of yourself, you're being egotistical, Jeff. You're being mm -hmm. egotistical, Ben. So, yeah. you know, I'm not talking about being narcissistic and thinking you're all that, but even having a strong sense of your own value has been shunned. You know, they, yeah. can, they can't control us if we value ourselves. You know, we won't buy stupid things if we like ourselves because we won't need to be cool because we bought something we already feel cool. So there's a lot invested in us not thinking we're all that or not thinking we're all much of anything. They make a lot more money if we don't believe in ourselves than if we do believe in ourselves. And the whole spiritual world bashing the ego, even though the bashers are usually incredibly unhealthily egoic in every regard, you know, the whole guru trip, the whole patriarchal spiritual movement is so much about, you know, desecrating and denying the value of the ego, blaming the mind instead of the feelings on everything. That also leads us away from having a strong sense of self. So people go to therapy, you know, with a good therapist to build the self-concept. And then they go into a spiritual room and they're told to banish and destroy and dismember the ego. And this, mm. it's just a completely confusing mind fuck for people. And <laughs> at the end of the day, nobody walks around really feeling a sense of their own value. And if they're too in, in anyone who leans in that direction is often referenced as narcissistic. So you just have a confused world around a sense of self. Um, and as a result, when relationship things happen, people's fallback position is to just move more in the direction of self-hatred, even if nothing that happened should ever have given them the feeling that they don't have value. In fact, I mean, people will yeah. tell people it's not about you, but people don't believe them. They take it personally. <laughs> yeah. That me, me, I'm included. <laughs> yeah. And I've been there too. Absolutely. Because for, for, if you're in a place where you feel love for somebody and you feel ready to engage deeper with that somebody. And this is kind of this self-centeredness in not, not the healthiest sense sometimes of our connections is that we're so in that feeling that it seems unimaginable that another person wouldn't walk that door, right? <laughs> yeah. What we seem to forget is that we're not that other person, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, we're so in the codependent merging of it. We're so in the, I want it that bad that we aren't paying attention to the fact that the other person's not where we are and they're not who we are. They're not, and, and even if they have feelings, somebody can have really profound feelings for Ben Harris, but it doesn't mean every other part of them is aligned with readiness to move in that direction. Sometimes the power of the connection shines a light on their dark places and shows them that they're absolutely not ready to walk through that door. And that's got nothing to do with your value. I mean, if anything, it has something to do with how valuable you are 
mm. that you were valuable enough to actually shine a bright light on their dark places and help them to realize they're not ready yet. I love that, Jeff. Like, holy cat, like, this is what you talked on. I mean, all of that is worth a thousand replays, but like, like, especially like towards the end of like, sometimes they leave because the connection shines a bright light on their dark places and they're not ready to work them through. So you said, typically we will feel devalued or not or unworthy, but that, that actually should do the inverse of because we do have that value of shining that light. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. So in the, in the connection that I wrote about that uncommon bond was inspired by, um, and I wrote my master's thesis about this connection as well in 2000. Um, the experience of it was that, I mean, this, the person that I engaged with was somebody who had had many years of, as I said before, great capacity to open the door, but not a great capacity to walk all the way through it. Um, I love that. She was a door open. She was a door opener. She was what they would call in the Sanskrit and Hindu world, you know, a um, upa guru, not a sat guru, not a realized master. They don't even exist. But that aside, a door opener. So she was an expert door opener, a hard opener, knew exactly all the different things to do. But then the moment it would get too connected for her all of her unresolved material, her patterning, her reactivity, her yes. fear of vulnerability, all that stuff took over, right? Um, I feel you. And, and, and that's very common. And that's also an age thing. You know, sometimes somebody's at a certain, she was in her 20s, I was in my mid to late 30s. At a, and I was just able to hold the door open. So if I had had that experience five years earlier, I was still her behaviorally. Mm. Um, but I had reached a different stage and I could tolerate, I did work in bioenergetics. I worked with Al Owen. So I had developed my capacity to tolerate feeling, including risky feelings. Um, at an earlier age, I didn't have that capacity to tolerate risky feelings. Mm. And a lot of times people leave connections because they can't tolerate risk. It's, it, it brings up too much stuff. It feels too aligned with or congruent with their early life experiences the traumatic experiences they really want to play it safe um and then they play it safe and feel frustrated and agitated because there's not enough edge to it and so then they have to move in the direction of something else in their life i mean this is we learn from these kinds of experiences relationship was a laboratory but in this experience it was very clear and became very clear over time that i but and of course in the feelings in the throes of it i couldn't see any of this people mm -hmm. would say this to me and it was like preposterous to me yeah. But what I now understand, because I can see more clearly in my age and stage of life, that this was a person who in the connection was so, it was so profoundly uncommonly bonded that it brought every single shadowy, defended, armored, reactive, avoidant part of her way more intensely to the surface stuff that she had stayed much longer in relationships with people she had much less feeling for at yeah. prior stages of her life because it was safer yes and there was no great fear that she was going to be lost shattered betrayed all the different things that had happened to her in early life and and so this is the thing everybody has what i call in soul shaping my first book the habitual range of emotion they have their range their comfort or their discomfort zone and they organize their life around that so they'll open in one way and close in another because they want to stay in range and then life forces us to tighten our range or to choose to expand our range. And if we decide we're somebody who's determined to expand our range, then we're forced to deal with everything unlike itself, right? We're forced to deal with everything unlike that bright light, which means the shadow. Because unless we come to understand how we narrow and tighten our range relationally and in other parts of our life, then we will never be able to hold the container safe for a profound and risky feeling love connection. Um, mm. And, you know, there's a lot of people, she was a woman who was able to do all kinds of risky things everywhere, jumping out of airplanes, you know, learning how to fly, um, jumping into rivers from 80 feet up, you know, things that mm. I would never do. But in the relational field, she was played it safe by never staying too long in anything powerful. Mm. And we got to understand that this is how people work psychologically 
we need to be trained to understand this. So when we encounter this in a relationship, we actually have some information to guide us so that we don't move in the direction of taking it personally. Wow, that's so powerful. And so, um, and I, I just love how you do combine this spiritual, like you're grounded in both, right? Instead of being just completely, because if you're just extreme in the other is you're avoidant, right. essentially, right? Right, they're both, both polarities. Mm-hmm. like overly practical or overly so-called spiritual they're both polarities yeah i'm into in real men i'm into trying to hold all of it so like what you probably want i mean of course it depends on your what calls you so if you if you have a calling to be the guy who's going to find the vaccine that's going to resolve the problem with the coronavirus let's say that's your calling mm-hmm. and let's say it's something you're charged up about doing the last thing you may want to do on the edge of that creative process is have a relationship that feels edgy and risky and powerful like that um, and forces you to keep doing all kinds of deep work to clear the next stage of debris that's in the way of staying open, right? You may want a very grounded, practical, nurturing, safe, solid connection. Mm. Um, Depends on what your sacred purpose is. For everybody, relationship isn't a part of it or that type of relationship isn't a part of it. But for me, the ultimate path is one that combines, say, what we might call soul mating, which means an, a bridge of essence between two souls, just a feeling or sense of, of soulfulness in the connection that you can't quite put to words, but it has a lot of deep meaning for you. And then all of the more grounded sensibility aspects of relationship. That means you can take that, bring that into the world, function in the world, take the world seriously. So it's not a connection that can only exist on a mountaintop. It's a connection that can exist in the heart of daily life. And for me, I call that soul mating, S-O-L-E-M-A-T-I-N-G, mm. and ultimately whole mating in the book so that you know, you, you're able to meet in all of these different places and function together in all these different places. Um, and that's not for everybody. You know, that's yeah. not, that's, that's an arduous path to relationship is at this stage of human development where it's all most people can do to figure out who they are if they can to try to figure out how to work a beautiful connection over decades and decades is an enormous task everybody yeah. should be getting medals who achieves it <laughs> yeah. um, you know i think we have very unrealistic expectations at this stage of development for relationship and i think at the same time we have to ultimately move in the direction of understanding that it is a profound portal to divinity once we reach a stage where we can hold it safe. What's up, my friends? If you are looking for more ways to go inward, more ways to do the work in reality and also spiritual, then I invite you to the Freedom School. It is our membership where we meet weekly. So every single week we have weekly workshops, live group coaching where we get to answer your questions. What are your issues? What are your problems? What struggles are you facing? What questions do you have? We get to answer the entire group's questions Every single week with experts, with myself, we get to dive in and really do the work. If this sounds like you and you want access to our library of lessons and get discounts to our in-person retreats, then join the Freedom School, our private membership. Go to feeling-free.com slash membership to sign up or click the link in my description or in the notes, go to feeling-free.com slash membership. And I would love to see you on our next workshop at the Freedom School. Mm, so if you were to teach like a, like if you had five minutes to teach the world and especially the young world about like the psychological points of relationships to understand, like what would you advise in addition to what we've already wow. talked about? five minutes i think i'd have to prepare i might have to prepare that five minutes ben um (laughs) but i don't know like if i was talking to young people who were moving in the direction of it pining away for it thinking it's the most important thing in the world all Mm -hmm. that stuff i would say you know find out for yourself through your lived experience and not through what anyone else tells you what your sacred purpose is in this life and decide whether or not profound love relationship is part of that. If it isn't, mm-hmm. it's no problem. Your energy you may need to go somewhere else, wherever you need to go. Um, but if it is that, if, it, if you really sense, and not from a codependent place, you know, you have to do enough work on yourself to make sure you're coming from a healthy place when you pine away for relationship. Because if you're doing it to fill a void, it's not going to work. If you're doing it to gain a sense of your own value, it's not really going to work. 
Um, but if you're doing it, if it's coming from a natural desire to love and you've reached enough of a stage of self-love where you can really be present for someone and mature enough to hold a container for them and see them independent of yourself, then you need to really work on your own path and process internally to prepare yourself for it. And also in the heart of it, it's not all about prep work. I mean, so much of it happens together yeah. with someone. Um, you also want to make sure that whoever you're stepping into the field with is at the same stage of development, preparedness, and interest in going deeper in a relationship. You, and you need to get that on the table early or test it early. You may not always get an honest answer because a relationship will force things, make people aware of things in themselves they didn't know existed. But, but you don't want to live in the naivete. You want to not mm -hmm. waste your time in that. You know, if you see a warning sign, you want to get it on the table and address it and not be afraid to talk about it. Because if you can't talk to them about it, then they're not at a stage that they're gonna be able to hold a relationship safe anyway. Um, and then, the, and I guess the last piece is that I would tell people to create space within their world to make sure that they prioritize it enough that there's space to do the work that's going to come up in the heart of a powerful connection. If you have a powerful connection, there's no way to avoid it, stuff's coming up because not only your individual stuff will come up in the heart of the vulnerability, but also this collective ancestral generational stuff is all going to come up. You know, we're like the first generations of people that have even begun to address the relational yeah. field. Um, so there's a lot of weight on us and a lot of pressure on it. And, and I think ultimately we need to not be super hard on ourselves. I think we're too hard on ourselves with, with respect to relationship and we have unrealistic expectations of other and unrealistic expectations of relationship itself. And I think we need to bring those back into a more grounded perspective. I love that. So why do we have an unrealistic expectation of relationship? Uh, Valentine's Day, love songs. Um, <laughs> I think on the deepest level, yeah. we are built for profound love experience uh, on every level, in every form of love. And, you know, I think that there's a, that part of us calls to us. It's like it's like the future of humanity. Mm -hmm. to reach the stage where we're able to do love a whole lot better than we've done it so far. Um, and I, and I think it's really real. And I think connection is the portal to divinity or is perhaps the most profound portal to divinity. You know, a lot of the patriarchal spiritualists will obsess over meditation and they'll call it the Royal road to the kingdom of God. Well, that's because they've never really been in love, you know, mm -hmm. um, because when you have been, you understand that there's a whole other level, a whole other profound level of possibility that comes into visual um, you get visual contact with in the heart of a deep heart opening um, we're built for that and it's beautiful that we're built for that but we also have to understand human context that a lot of us aren't ready for that we can open the door but it's very hard to hold the door open and there's going to be a lot of work at this stage that has to be done if you have that profound experience in order to see it through if your desire is to see it through for a lifetime because we're not in survivalist love ground anymore where it was yeah. all based on duties, roles, polarities. We're in authentic love ground now where it's about who you really are, what you're becoming, what your sacred purpose is. It is way more beautiful, but it is way more complicated than a survivalist yeah. love construct. And more work. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so you've got to be really willing to do the work and or with someone also who is willing to do the work. And if you're not or they're not, then you're pretty much just wasting your time yeah so it's pretty and it goes back to um at the beginning how we talked about like we've been told this or taught this or haven't taught this and so we're living in this old paradigm of like our expectations right. are this old paradigm so i assume that's part of the reason why we're getting hurt disappointed etc yeah i mean if you come from a survivalist world that says that once you're married that's it your first yeah. partner will accept you no matter what. You'll put up with each other no matter what. You'll do whatever adaptations you need. You'll get your man cave so you can have your time to yourself. You know, the woman, if it's a woman, will have whatever she needs. You know, I mean, all the ways in which this has been organized since the beginning of time, it doesn't work very well anymore because for the most part now, people move in the direction that their growth takes them. They're actually growing mm -hmm. beings. They're, you know, they're, they're a work in process now, um, not a work in progress. It's different now. It's becoming different now. And as their sacred purpose unfolds, as their reason for being unfolds, as they have a vaster array of life experiences to draw from than they had 50, 100, 300 years ago, um, more information and feedback 
you know, um, they have adventures in soul shaping, I call them, where all of a sudden who they thought they were yesterday has just changed because now they had a breathwork experience and they realize they're not that being anymore. They've evolved beyond it. So when you get into this more authentic terrain where people are trying to not figure out what puts food on the table, what's the best way to organize practically, but how they really feel and who they really are, it changes the relationship paradigm completely. So if you're holding on to the old idea that marriage means that's the end of the story, no matter what you do and what changes you grow through and all the rest of it, you're not living in the world we're stepping into and that we've stepped into anymore. And there is a battle between these two notions of reality. The survivalist notion is you stick together and hold, cling together for dear life, both within family and within partnership. And the more authentic one is that you just keep evolving towards wholeness which means you're going to shed connections along the way as you move closer and closer towards a more refined sense of your own self. And so now we've entered a new world and we have to let go of those attachments too. You can be deeply involved in loving a being, but you know, you have to let go of the idea that they have to stay there because you've made a pact. It just it, clearly that's mm-hmm. not working anymore. It just doesn't work. anymore. Yeah. I love that. And I mean, it's yeah i mean not easy but like i love like change like shifting that and i also love the metaphor of how you said opening the door but not being able to walk through it so if someone is listening and they're someone who's opening the door but not walking through and i've heard you also say like would this be associating intense love with chaos right so so i mean it depends on the trip i've mm-hmm. i've been in experiences on both sides of the experiences where I associated peak experiences or intensities with real love, true love. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And I, I grew up in a super chaotic environment, so I had license to associate love with intensity um, and love with chaos and love with, you know, and, and anything that felt stable or, Mm -hmm slower or more subtle or more reality based felt dangerous to me. I associated that with uh, engulfment, entrapment, um, not with freedom, the freedom to have a profound peak experience moment, for example. And, and so I, and as a result, very healthy functioning women who could hold both who could have intense experiences, but also had a more stable base than I did, um, would end up very disappointed because I could only have one door open, but not the other door. I was like a one winged bird, which means ultimately it all had to come crashing down to earth because it had no feet to it. And, you know, the woman I wrote about in an uncommon bond was somebody who was uh, an absolute intensity fanatic. She grew up with an enormous amount of intensity. Um, and was incredibly profound and powerful in the heart of these intensities. Um, but the moment it went softer and stiller and felt safer, it actually felt mm-hmm. terrifying. And, you know, so people like that and people like me at those stages in my life, the kindest thing I could have probably done was to have stayed away from relationship and gone to work on myself more deeply. Mm-hmm. Um, But of course, my drive to arrive relationally was strong also, even if on another level, I was completely avoidant on another level, I was completely determined. And, you know, so you're, you're, when you walk, when you go out on a date, you sit at a table with someone, you're sitting at a table with every place they've been and every unresolved experience they've had and, you know, every commitment they've made and faltered in the heart of and every heartbreak they've experienced and you know, they just look like a beautiful being that you're projecting feelings onto, but there's a whole million threads of them you cannot possibly know in a short yeah. period of time. You just can't. You might be able to see through to what you think is their essence that lives beyond personality, all that stuff. But the other stuff is real too, you know? So in my Uncommon Bond experience, it was like, okay, how could you destroy this? This is the most yes. profound. Mm-hmm. By her own admission, it wasn't all coming from me. This was her story too. And you know, and for her, she had all, thousands of reasons to destroy it based on who she was psychologically, what was unresolved within her and all the reasons she had from her lived experience to be terrified of that degree of profound vulnerability. And, you know, if only we could get all that information. I mean, 
there were signs in the beginning, but I, of course you ignore them because you're yeah. the love part just takes uh -huh. over. And if we could just find a way to like stop in the beginning and just say, what you just said, tell me more about that. Cause is that going? And I remember one time in the early part of the experience, she said to me, and this, it was like a very genuine moment. We were walking in Pennsylvania and she just said, God, I hope I can hold this one safe. I hope I can hold this one safe. So that was good information for me. And I heard it. And I, part of me said, this is important information, Jeff. You know, she, she said that and, verbally and, to and you. I, yeah. She said it out loud. It was wow. like her narrative was allowed. Like she was aware of wow. her history, her wild, crazy history. And more than I was aware of it. And I noticed it. I flagged it. I got this matters, but I didn't take it seriously. But as you get older and you've lived enough and you want to protect yourself a little bit more, um, you have that kind of experience. You would stop and go, tell me more about that because maybe we need to stop right now. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's the Maya Angelou quote. Um, when people tell you who they are, believe them. Yeah. You know? And I would modify it to, you know, when people show you who they are, believe them, because they don't always mm. tell you. Um, but it's one of the most important and horrifyingly annoying quotes <laughs> that I've ever <laughs> encountered. And the other yeah. horrifying quote that I've encountered in the relational field is what my mother used to say, because she hung in there with my father under impossible circumstances. And she used to say, um, live in hope, die in despair. And you know, I'd say, well, doesn't that mean you should end the marriage? I mean, if you're, yeah. you know, but she had belief systems around why you stay mm -hmm. in the marriage. And, but, you know, there's wisdom in those quotes. Um, we just have to be prepared to embrace the wisdom of them and, and not just live in the fantasy. We have to be able to hold the fantasy and the reality at the same time. Yeah. I'm like, I love this direction. And as far as just like the fantasy and the reality or the so-called spiritual and the so-called practical, like it's a dance of both. And, you know, like, man, like, yeah, I just it's think all the same. It's all the same. I mean, what happens mm. is you reach a stage where you don't even see the spiritual as separate from the practical. You just see well, spirituality like as spirituality is, is humanness. I mean, I wrote a whole book grounded spirituality about that. And to me, it's just the same thing. And so you don't, you're not polarizing anymore. You're, you're, you know, presence becomes a whole being experience where everything's there at the same time. And so if you see the world through that lens, if you encounter someone that you feel this profoundly subtle, soulful, essential connection to what we would traditionally call a soulmate, you, another part of you um, pipes up and says, can they meet you on the ground? How do they walk on the earth? You know, are they, mm -hmm. Are they pr able to function in relationship to other? Are they able to pay their bills? Are they able to? And you don't see that as something that you put away and go, oh, who cares? It doesn't matter because we have a soul connection. Yeah. No, no, no. You understand that it's all part of your soul connection and that it really matters if they can't function in the world. And if they're brilliant, beautiful beams of light wearing white clothes with new names, sleeping in their cars on the beach of Maui, calling themselves enlightened, they may be able to do soul gazing with you for a million years, but they can't do anything else. And that mm. that's spiritual too. That's spiritual too. I love that. Woo. Like, yeah. Like, so what do you think about it's the It's all real. <laughs> it's all real. It's all real. Right. Yeah. It's all real. Yeah. I love, like, what would you, what do you think of the phrase? Like, all you need is love. Um, I think it's stupid. Uh, I mean, I think it's a very it. wonderful song lyric. Um, yeah. and it helped me. I, I love the way the Beatles sing that song. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. Um, but that, that was the, the, it's interesting you mentioned that because that was a line that I used to have in my mind in the heart of this experience, yeah. the impossibility of this bonded experience, because I realized at that time, it was the most painful thing to learn that love is not enough. Mm -hmm. You you have to align on a hundred other levels. Like love's enough if you want to love shit, if you want a brief encounter, if you want an occasional encounter, if you want, but if you want a relationship, yes. love's only one wing of a multi-winged path and process that is real relationship. And it's a completely different story. Yeah, you need to have love. I mean, well, you don't. I mean, people have practical relationships all the time that serve various purposes. They've arranged marriages all the time where there's not a lot of what we would call love in the romantic sense. Um, but I mean, I think if you want to have a lasting relationship, if that means something to you, 
in a real sense, then you know, love's just love's just the premise. It's just the beginning. It's the, mm. it's stage one, but it's not the end of the story. I love. Ah, I love. Most that. people, who, most people who get divorced still love each other in many ways, mm. but they're getting divorced for all kinds of other reasons. Yeah. Will you touch on, touch more on like the love ship versus relationship? Like, what are the differences? So, so I'll do it in the in the context of the book, the uh, situation I wrote about an uncommon bond. So, the immediacy of the feeling, the love feeling, the deep inner knowing and the feeling that you've encountered this soul in previous lives or were, deter or were destined to encounter them in this life. The feeling of being lit up, cracked open, um, you know, all of a sudden transported into a, a connection to an expansive universe that you didn't even know existed. I mean, this is just ways of describing the love experience. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing. And then you have to live in a room together okay <laughs> and you have to meet on a whole bunch of other levels obviously practical levels how you're going to organize your reality financially it matters in this world um how how that person functions do they go to bed at certain hours do they stay up all night um what are their unresolved psychological issues what are their triggers what are your triggers how do your triggers relate to one another how do they and how do they uh, excavate your material um, how do you, you know, do you agree on basic ideas of how you want to organize your life, what you're striving towards? Somebody might want to save money for the future. Somebody might want to completely live in the moment. Somebody may want to always be in motion. Somebody may want to stay grounded and more domestic. You know, there's yeah. all of these different things have to find a way to work together even if you love each other um, and learning how to listen to each other. Some people love each other deeply, but they can't sit still and listen to one another. So if you can't listen to each other, then when things come up in the relationship, they never get resolved. If somebody's not emotionally mature enough to look at their own behavior and their own way of interfacing and their own way of avoiding certain things, if the connection continues and proceeds, at some point it's going to fall apart because you may have one person who's wanting to have a more authentic relating based connection and another person who has no interest in those processes, not one interest at all in them. You love them. You, they light you up when you're around them, but you don't know how to talk to each other. And at some point along the way, pretty soon after the beginning, that's going to start to really matter. And so to me, you have to be able to relate in a healthy, fluid, conscious or relatively conscious way if you're going to sustain the connection once the material starts showing up and if the love is profound the material is going to show up pretty fast you know mm -hmm. it's not going to lie it's not going to take a long time to begin i mean if i look at that connection the triggers were there within five minutes because the connection was that profound and mm. and as i said earlier you're 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 excavating not only is your lived experience all that material coming up um, stuff that when you're on you, your own, you don't even know you're carrying, but you also start dealing with all of the collective material. The The vibration of the collective is that we don't know how to hold vulnerability safe relationally with another human being. That's just the way our world is organized. Survivalist world doesn't have that sensitivity and subtlety. It's practical and hardcore and grounded and assembled like that. And so once you start opening in those tender places, you don't live in a world that knows what to do with that. Um, so you got a, you're up against a lot of things. Yeah. And that's why uncommon bonds in the studies generally have shown that people who encounter these connections at a younger age, and I mean 20s and 30s, and maybe even 40s, they don't usually last. It's too powerful. The vibration just doesn't work in this world. And it brings up more stuff than anyone has time to process in a working life. And usually these people often re-encounter them each other in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. And they're finally at a stage where they can hold these connections safe because they have enough maturity or their circumstances are changed and they can make the distinction between where they end and the other begins. When you're mm. younger with these experiences, you become merged and you can no longer tell where you end and the other begins. And it becomes this insanely in activated um, acting out um, codependent fusion that ultimately doesn't serve a sustainable adult relationship. Man, so like when you look at your own experience, how have you matured like in your relationship now in 
in love with yourself and like how has how have you been able to hold it now like when you look back at it how are you mature like what is the difference with yourself i think that my capacity to hold uncomfortable feelings is much more expansive expansive than it used to be Mm -hmm. like i can sit in the trigger doesn't mean i don't get triggered but i can sit in when i was younger the moment i felt i felt so much more frequently triggered first of all Mm. i wasn't as solid i wasn't as physically solid like literally Mm. solid um and i think that actually matters and and i think that my beaker was filled with a lot more unresolved material from early life than it is now and so i think now it's uncomfortable uncomfortable but it uncomfortable used to be the end of the story but for me it's just the beginning of the story now wow um, i love that so i think that's changed and i also think that for me finding my sacred purpose my calling to write changed everything because mm-hmm. What happens when you get emblazoned on your path, when you wake up every morning knowing why you're here, even if it's a hard path, just knowing why you're here, somehow it, be, it, it, it creates a kind of contrast to the rest of your experience so that it becomes like a buffer against the madness of the world and it also becomes a bit of a buffer against your own madness and your relational madness because it gives you perspective on what matters, what's worth focusing on, and then another part of you just nullifies the need to focus on the small things. Um, the small things become generally less important when you're on, on, your, on fire with your path and your purpose. And at an earlier stage in the confusion of directionality and with nothing to contrast my experience to, I spent wasted a lot more time in the heart of stupid incidental triggers. And mm-hmm. now they just don't seem to matter as much. So it's just, I've got something better to do. So <laughs> it means that the things you end up having to deal with are things that really matter relationally. It's not like they be, you're not, you're not avoidant. Um, it's more selective because you also have your focus somewhere else. The relationship's not everything in your life. And it, 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 that get, puts you in a position to be more selective about which parts of the relationship you want to focus on. Man, I really like that. So for people in their 20s, 30s, or 40s, just like... Find your path. Find your path. Focus on you. Find your path. Find your path. Find your path. Yeah, and it can be a relational path. You, you may have great work to do in the world, you, do, you know, the work you're trying to do and help people. And it can have a relational quality to it, but but your, your whole fixate, you're not looking for relationship to be your primary and only purpose. Um, mm. And for some people it is, but you're, it's coming from, in that case, if it's going to work, it comes from a very healthy clarity as to who they are and why they're here. You know, some people are just really built to live primarily through partnership. Um, and other people are built to live partly through partnership and partly through something else that they're here to bring to the world. It's all relational. My work is relational. I'm writing for people. I'm not just writing for me alone on an island. It has a relational quality to it. But, you know, the, the desire to be in connection doesn't come from a desperate need mm. to find path purpose, to bail me out from my confusion as to who I am and why I'm here. You don't want to choose relationship from that place um, unless it really is absolutely fundamental to your path and purpose. And a lot of young people, you know, they have so the sexual charge is part of it too. They're, they have so much physical charge and it's very hard to differentiate that charge from feelings uh, for another person. And mm. you live long enough and you can distinguish the charge from the person and understand that you could be projecting a whole lot of stuff because of that energetic charge um, that doesn't belong there, you know, and I look back on certain people that I thought I was in love with and it was ridiculous. You know, there was no basis for that just because I had a feeling just because I had a moment, just because I had a turn on, just because I, you know, it's, you know, you need to, you need to live enough in relationship land and then you start to have enough clarity because you've had so many experiences that when you have experiences later in life, you can put them into perspective a lot quicker than when you're younger. And it really helps. Love that. Thank you for sharing. And um, will you touch on what you call jab, G A B? Because, like, J- this J-A-B. is. J A B. Yeah. J A B. Yes. Yeah. I'm writing, just writing a course about it. So, at some point along the way, it was clear that I had a very, very, you know, high level, deep level is probably the better way to put it, abandonment wound. Um, and it was all intertwined with jealousy and betrayal stuff. And so I 
took to calling a jab, the jealousy, abandonment, betrayal wound, that I was stabbed by jab. And I had some friends, we would talk about that. And we, you know, we would help each other. We, we called ourselves the jab busters. So, <laughs> like because everybody seemed to have a deep abandonment wound. So whenever they were in their wound, you know, we would engage to try to support the other. I even had a pair of overalls I kept called jabberalls that <laughs> say jab, jab busters on them. And, and you know, th so this, this, particular wound which originated primarily in my early life experience with my mother and the adoption of my brother and um and i think trails back into my familial lineage my dna because my dad carried a similar wound and mm -hmm. and never shared those experiences with me but the feeling of his rejection trigger was very similar to mine it felt physically the same to be around it and so you know i think they call that epigenetics or something like that yeah. um so for me this particular wound led me in many directions one was never committing because if i didn't commit i could never be abandoned i was always in control right. and then i had the uncommon bond experience and of course i was forced right back into the worst and most horrifying experience of the abandonment wound possible because i because you abandoned, were abandoned yep. i was abandoned um and i then you know thereafter as i said earlier had to make a decision am i going to armor up which means go back into mr self-protection always in control never committing or am I going to allow myself to open my heart in the heart of this? And I went to Harbin Hot Springs uh, in California, a place I used to go um, for a few weeks. And I did the deepest work I'd ever done in, in my body, in the heart of the wound and, and mm. in the heart of all my wounds. It all became one big giant wound. And, and I really felt at the end of that deep release, smashing the ground, running through the woods, crying in the warm pool. It was just like weeks. Of, it was just like days and days of this stuff. And dancing wildly they had like a barefoot boogie and just moving all these feelings that mm. were just wildly inside of me um and at the end of it i felt somehow like i had corralled much more of that wound not all of it because it it was way goes way too deep in me to ever be fully healed or corralled but but a lot of it felt like it had been worked through and i felt like i could hold a container differently and i felt like my experience of reality had changed i was ready to write and i had a lot more clarity than i had before that experience and it had something to do with allowing myself to heal some part of that abandonment wound. yeah like but you know but this is a deep wound and you know people yeah. really i think that everyone's carrying it everybody i've ever met is carrying it to some extent it's like the great wound and it's the wound that's not written about enough, not talked about enough. Uh, therapists don't want to go too close to it. A lot of them because they're carrying it. And uh, I think like the therapist personally, like themselves. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. So it makes them uncomfortable. Them oh yeah. A lot of people like anyone who's had a glimpse of this high level, crazy triggering and the abandonment wound, you know, really is it's scary you know, because it's, it has a physiological quality to it. It can just take mm. over your life. And, you know, you hear a lot of the crazy actings out that go on out there with people killing their exes. It's abandonment wound. It's jab. They're triggered. I mean, this is why they're doing it because their trigger is whatever the experience they're having in the moment is, is being fed by the reaction to it by all kinds of early unresolved stuff around early life abandonment. And, and so I think people at a young age, if they can need to look at this, like, do I carry this wound? And if I do, how is it affecting my choices? Is it making me unavailable in relationship? Cause I don't want to get abandoned. And if it is, how am I languaging that? Am I doing what a lot of men do and talk about how, you know, they're too pure for relationship. They want to keep them, you know, they become monastic, they become pure yogis. They, you know, really a lot of, t that's just the abandonment that's just got a new narrative for itself. So it can mask the fact that it's, they're afraid of caught deeper contact. You know, it doesn't mean it's always true. Sometimes it's part of their path and purpose to not be in relationship at stages of life. There's nothing wrong with that. As long as you're honest with other people about that and don't mislead them, there's never anything wrong with saying, I'm not ready for relationship. Um, then people can make their own choice if they want to participate and engage with you or not, you know, but that's one way or, or to look at it the other way, which is that instead of being the one on the dance floor, who's always isolating, maybe you're the one on the dance floor who's always trying to fuse, you're grabbing, you're holding on, you're, you know, you know, oftentimes you can't get a relationship because people sense the desperation in your energy. It feels arbitrary. It doesn't feel like that you're really making contact with them, you know, and it can rule your life that you, you, you won't let yourself live. You won't let yourself find your path and purpose. You won't let yourself know peace until you find somebody else to merge with. So 
If that's you, you want to do work therapeutically around that because that is absolutely and utterly going to get in your way in partnership from mm. manifesting the kind of partnership you need and want. And the abandonment wound is a self-fulfilling prophecy. One way or the other, however yeah. you respond to it or behave to it, it creates more of, more of the same terms and conditions that is exactly the thing you don't want and yet you get more of that. So it's an important thing to look at early. Yeah, like we try of avoiding it or we don't want it to happen, so therefore it happens. Yeah, well, yeah, like if you're, if you're, if you're, sorry, I'm just making notes for my, because I'm writing a course about this and I, I want to add that. Yeah, part. I love um, it. Um, the self-fulfilling prophecy part, but right. So if, if you're, if your whole thing is that you're going to avoid relationship, no matter what language you use and how fancy you make it sound, because you have an abandonment wound, then you will create a reality ultimately where you are alone and feel abandoned yes. by humanity. Yeah. And if you have an abandonment wound that makes you feel like, you know, the only solution is you're going to keep fusing and fusing and fusing, you're going to either pick the wrong person or you're going to never manifest anyone because you're so damn desperate. And you're again going to end up feeling abandoned. Yeah. Either way, you're going to end up abandoned. Yeah. Um, so the bridge is healing. Healing is the bridge so that you can reach a stage where you're coming to connection from all the right places. Well, Jeff, sounds like we need that course. Of course, it's almost done. <laughs> I love it. That's awesome. Um, well, like, yeah, this is this is incredible. Like, thank you for sharing so much of your story. Like, where else do you see people from your own experience, your life, where however you feel it or see it, that we sabotage ourselves? And if a relationship is what we want, how do we how do we sabotage sabotage ourselves? So if somebody want, uh, oh, so like patterns, uh, patterns of self-sabotage and connection or something. Yeah. Like what have you seen? Everything I've done, everything, <laughs> um, you know, so what have I seen? What have I done? Um, um, well, I mean, one of the most obvious ways is you, I mean, this is so unconscious. This is why we have to bring things to consciousness, but yes. you know, you're starting to get closer and then you, do you say to the person you're not sure you need to go and date other people, even if you really don't want to date other people. Um, and you're saying it to somebody who's a fuser attacher and who will never tolerate that has no interest in polyamory. It's a way of self-sabotaging. Mm. Um, you don't show up when you're supposed to show up. It's a way of self-sabotaging. You, you decide that you need a break, you, 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 but you really don't need a break. You need a, you, you think you need a break, or, but you really know on some level that's going to put an end to the connection. It's another mm -hmm. way that we'd, I mean, th the problem with self-sabotage is that if you're doing these many different things, there's a million ways you can do that. Um, it really says that you really aren't ready. Mm -hmm. So, you know, rather than labeling it, which is sort of dysfunctional self-sabotaging behavior, we might want to just look at it more in terms of it being a, you know, oddly appropriate response given your level of readiness Ooh, i like that will you repeat and, that i actually like that yeah and yeah it, it's an oddly appropriate response given your level of readiness mm -hmm. um so sure it's sabotaging but it's sabotaging for a reason and the reason is because you are literally not at a stage where you're emotionally able to hold a love heart connection safe right um so the real question people probably need to ask is not am I self-sabotaging, but what does this say about where I'm at on the path relationally? Mm -hmm. And instead of beating ourselves up for it, just yeah. going, owning it, just owning it, that if you keep doing that, it means that, you know, and I'm not talking about where you leave things that aren't a fit. It's when you're leaving things that could be a fit. That's what we're talking about with self-sabotage. Um, then you need to just ask yourself what it says about your level of readiness and stop wasting people's time, mm. you know, be, be um, protective of other enough and stop acting out this way to go and do the work within yourself to reach a stage where you're ready for what you say you're wanting. Um, because just keep walking back into the opening the door, bringing all these wonderful people through the door with you, which I did for a long time. And then slamming the door shut on them is yeah. nasty and yeah. has a actually a sociopathic quality to it you know i don't mean capital s sociopathic but it there's a level of unhealthy self-centeredness in that 
Um, that certainly reflects the fact that you're not ready for a relationship, but really, really is not a kind and um, appropriate way to behave. If, you, if you're really someone who keeps doing that, just go into therapy and figure out what the fuck is going on and stop hurting people. <laughs> I love how you um, reframe that actually. Cause yeah, the word I've never thought about this before, like self-sabotage is pretty shame, like shame ish. Shame. Yeah. yeah. Because it's informative. Like if we're willing to look at all of our actions as information, that doesn't mean that we don't discourage certain behaviors. That doesn't mean that we don't even shame certain behaviors, but ultimately nothing's going to change unless we see it as information. And what mm. is it trying to tell us? It's trying to tell us that we're not ready. We're not there. You know, part of us is tempted. We, part of us wants partnership. The deepest, truest part of us may want that, but there are other unresolved patterns that are in the way and they're preventing us from seeing it through. So instead of doing that, you know, I mean, I was, I remember being, you know, I mean, I was just a horny guy and I was, and I loved women. I mean, I would mm-hmm. leave notes on bikes, you know, I was like the street hit man, you know, and <laughs> I, I, you know, and I would project all these extraordinary things onto these strangers, you know, cause mm-hmm. I was just in love with being in love. I read Rumi poetry. I mean, it was, right. and then I would really not see anything through, you know, and, and I would just sever or cut off or whatever. And then I remember I reached a stage in my own maturation where I became less self-absorbed and I would was able to leave back in the old days on, on the bell answering system, you could leave underground messages for people if they also had bell call answer. So my first step into being aware of other, and I was in my early thirties. I mean, it took a long time for me was to be able to leave a message in the underground, letting them know that I didn't want to proceed and not to take it mm. personally and to let them know where I was at. And it was actually a progressive step. It was, I was becoming aware right. that there was a piece of person with feelings on the other side of that phone. <laughs> now I wasn't calling them directly. I was doing the bell call answer underground. Right. But, but that tells you that if 10 years earlier that I was completely and remarkably unaware and uninterested in, I was locked in my own narcissistic wound bubble relationally. Um, And, you know, I think that if I had had exposure to someone like me right now who had said, listen, if you keep doing this, it means you're not ready. Stop fucking with people. Go work on yourself until you're ready. I think it would just save a lot of trouble in the world. And I think if men could talk to each other that way, it would would be very helpful also, you know, and and in the right way, in the way guys can handle it, where you're not coming on too strong that they get defensive, but you're not coming in too soft that they don't take you too seriously, you know? Mm -hmm. You got to do it kind of Alec Baldwin style and then they'll listen to you, you know? I like that. I'm going to channel him yeah. next time. Yeah. Like, that's Absolutely. awesome. Yeah. No, he's, yeah, he's, de- I think he does it right. <laughs> um, like, so with all of these tools to heal, um, I mean, you've been, you know, in this game for a while, but with, you know, whether it's meditation and like therapy or like coaching, there's, mm-hmm so many different things and even those things can be avoidant or too much what is your suggestion to go like in work yeah for like that work yeah. well i would mostly say fuck meditation um i mean i know it's it's it's, <laughs> it's a big too. trendy uh yeah i would say it's just a, it's not a cathartic thing it's it's trendy i mean i think witnessing yourself if you're using meditation practice not in the way that most patriarchal spirituality wants you, because if you really look at the roots of their meditation practices, they're really to deny the veracity and significance of the localized self in the story, right? In the feelings. They're really about taking you to this amorphous absolute self field where apparently you're going to find great relief and meaning. You can't find purpose there because there's no self there. The absolute self is not going to give over your localized purpose. It doesn't work like that. So Eckhart Tolle is not going to lead you to yourself. He's going to lead you away from yourself. So, you know, if you're using meditation or self-witnessing practices more broadly, the way that I did at a certain stage of my life to look at myself behaviorally, to step back from how I behave at a table and ask myself where that was coming from and to, to start to try to use that practice to go deeper into an understanding of what was implicated, what was affecting me, what was, where it was coming from. It's fine. That's healthy witnessing because it includes understanding the psycho-emotional roots of your behavior. 
if you're using witnessing to deny the significance of all those things, then don't waste your time. It's not going to do much for you. It might give you a little relief here and there, but it's not going to heal these patterns. You need more cathartic work or you need work like Dick Schwartz's internal family systems work. So you begin to see and understand your parts and how they're operating. Um, and ultimately, I believe somatic psychotherapies are the answer. We often need talk therapy for a long time to prepare us for that. But I think something like bioenergetics, core energetics, um, Peter Levine's somatic experiencing work, it can be very helpful. So what are those? Like um, just like a brief overview of like bioenergetics? So bioenergetics, yeah, I mean, it's, it's Alexander. So Reich, Wilhelm Reich is said to be the primary founder. He broke away from Freud, like Jung, bro Jung broke away from Freud. Jung went in the direction he went, and Reich was really a body-centered psychotherapist, somatic work. So that the idea that instead of this fixation on the mind and the monkey mind and the patterns of the mind, which is the, the, the patriarchal spirituality's game to keep you away from your feelings, you keep fucking with the mind, witnessing the mind, working in the mind mm. to try to tame the mind, cognitive psych, all that bullshit. Um, basically, it's about dropping down into the body and understanding that the fucked upness in the mind is usually coming from the unresolved, what I call the monkey heart. I wrote about uh, this in Grounded Spirituality, in Grounded Spirituality. So it's that really almost all of it is happening in the deep within. And so for me, the more work I did discharging my holdings emotionally in the body, whether it was through holotropic breath work, bioenergetics, anger work, rage work, hitting foam cubes, opening up my chest, these various exercises in bio and core to open up the body and access all the old feelings and memories that are held in the body. They're not in the mind. The mind is symptomatic. They're held in the body itself. And when you do that work and start discharging it, you get to the heart of the matter. You get Ben right to the core material. And only when you get to the core material can you really transform yourself. You know, talking about, you know, one of the first things I wrote on a wall when I was young was excessive analysis perpetuates emotional paralysis. So you can make, I, I dated a woman who could name her stuff better than anyone I ever met in my life. But nothing ever changed because she didn't do any work in her body. She was just with an analyst five days a week. So great. They analyzed her so he could write articles about what happened to her. Well, it didn't help her. She was acting out in the same fucked up ways that she'd been acting out 20 years earlier. And it never, it's still happening to this day. And so you need to go into the body. You need to get to the real feelings. You don't need to talk about them. You need to let them speak to you. And wow. if you can do that deeper level of work, then there's a real hope for really serious, deep levels of transformation. Um, and it really helps relationally because if you keep coming to the table, even with an awareness of why you self-sabotage, you're going to keep self-sabotaging self yes. because on the deep level, nothing's changed. You just know why you do it or you think you know why you do it, but there's no substitute for actually getting into your bones and doing the real work to transform your consciousness. There's no substitute for that. Mm. That's powerful. Thank you, sir. And um, as we close, as we close up here, um, as we speak about all this work, um, one of the questions that you've posed is, or written, is when will I be done with this hard work so my life can begin? Yes. <laughs> you want an answer to that one? <laughs> I would, I'm sure every, my, I, yes. I, I mean, me and I everyone mean else. yes. So that, so, <laughs> right, right. So, so that was a question that people ask me and I would ask therapeutically, yes. how long is this going to take? How long yep. is this going to take? <laughs> yeah. And the answer is always the same. It's going to take your whole life, baby. Oh yeah. And, and, and it, and it really depends on what, where you're trying to get to. So if you want to, if you want to live in this body, in this life, in this incarnation, um, we don't, we won't even debate whether it's your only incarnation or not. Let's assume it is for the moment. If you want to get as close to wholeness as you can, then you got to keep going all the way to the end because there's going to be new levels of insight at this level of, at this stage of human development where there's so little that's conscious, uh, you just got to keep going. Um, and, and the good news is that after you work through the most difficult spikes and, and unresolved ranges of material, it gets easier. You, you get more, you have more peace with path. You have more mm. comfort in your own skin. You're more at peace in your own body. Stuff comes up, it's sometimes difficult, but it's never the same level of kind of like um, catastrophic difficulty that you experience in your 20s and 30s with this stuff. Um, it gets easier, you get more familiar with it, it, and you get kind of more interested in it and curious about it because it becomes less threatening, 
and you engage with it on all kinds of other levels because healthier parts of you are at the table now, you know? Mm. But if you're wanting to stop on growth altogether, then that's never going to turn out very well. You're going to hopefully keep growing at the end of your life, but you may not have to work with a therapist till the end of your life. Um, but if you're going in the room thinking you're going to need six power sessions and at the end of it, you're going to be ready to rock. You're going to be ready to rock as a survivalist maybe, but if you want to live a deeply authentic life, you're just going to keep having to do some degree of work all the way through your life. And you're going to want to, because it's not going to feel catastrophic. Again, you're going to feel real excited about having new eyes again and again, as you move mm. through stages of your own experience. I love that. The new eyes. So where, where are you experiencing new eyes right now? Uh, well, I'm in a pandemic, so I, this <laughs> <Are> feels <laughs> definitely like a, yeah, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> I feel uh, I feel like I've I've walked into very new and unfamiliar terrain, and I'm yeah. I'm settling down with it now. But so I'm I, it's not always comfortable. This has not been a comfortable experience on so many different levels. Um, but I feel I feel more broadly that aside, and it's hard to pull out of that. But I feel as though I'm feeling more I don't know at a, a more. I don't feel as charged and definitive about my offering. It feels more, mm. more solidified now, more matter of fact now, and more um, like I have more peace with it. Um, and it doesn't have the same beautifully desperate urgency that it had to bring my voice through. It feels like it's here um, and I'm unfolding in relation to it. And I'm feeling a little more balanced about it. It feels like I was very balanced and then the writing call took over and I've had 18 or 20 years of just like intense charge around bringing my voice out. It was, it was like, I had no choice. It, the calling mm. was that definitive inside of me. And, and now it just feels like it's, it's shifting and changing and I'm kind of more curious about that. And, and it, it feels like I'm at a stage where I can look out over the ocean and feel like I've accomplished so much of what I wanted to accomplish and, I don't feel, and I know there's still wonderful things that I'd like to do, but it just feels more peaceful now than it did mm. for a long time. Well, yeah. Jeff, that's awesome. Like, yeah, like, yeah, that's really cool. That was beautiful. I, I mean, I did everything on the list, you know, it's like there was a real clear list, right? Long books and blah, blah, blah. So I did those things and, um, and it was incredibly hard and it was, I mean, beyond anything, you know, I ran full-time jobs. I did this. I wrote till three in the morning. I mean, this is insanity what I did, but now it's like a different feeling. You know, it's just, it's a lovely, wonderful feeling. And I did it my way. I did it everything my way. I formed my own publishing house so I yeah. wouldn't be edited. I brought my language through the way I did everything against the rules, the way my soul told me to do it. So there's a real, if you can really find your soul's path and not in some kitschy, trendy way, but on a real deep private level, and you can actualize whatever that is for you. That is the most I could hope for. So that, you know, Virginia Satir said at the end of her life, the great sociologist, psychologist, she said, I did what I came here to do, you know? So if, you could, if we can all reach the stage where we set our world up so that everybody at the end of it looks back and says, I did what I came here to do, we'll be living in a very different world than the one we're living in now where mm. everybody's acting out the feeling that they have that they are not doing what they came here to do you know um better everybody finds what they came here to do and to me that's a life well lived really though that's beautiful and like would you because i associate that with freedom like when you talk about the sense of self and like yeah. authentic self yeah. to me that's yeah. what true freedom is yeah absolutely that's exactly it right there yeah it's not that you don't have attachments that's that's the patriarchal delusion you know detachment is a tool it's not a life you have attachments but everything's true to path. Your attachments, the work you do, um, the awareness you bring to things you have to do that don't gratify you. You don't really ever leave yourself at the door. You bring you with you everywhere you go and with everything you do. And you're, you're there for all the right reasons, you know, not for all kinds of dysfunctional reasons. And that is freedom. You know, that's, that's the great freedom right there. So you can wear a mask around town and not feel like big daddy government's controlling you because you already feel so free inside that these kinds of things don't make a difference. You don't need to prove yourself out there and how people perceive you doesn't determine how you feel about yourself because you've already proven it to yourself. 
and um, you've overcome everything. It's freedom. That's powerful. Thanks, man. Um, Thanks for that reminder. <laughs> you know, I'm going to, so during this whole interview, you had the video turned off. I'm going to turn it back on so I can see it. But honestly, Jeff, like this, like I love your perspective, your heart, the fusion of, but how they're the same. Like that was really profound for me to think of how the spiritual and practical are the same. So, but different at the same time. It's all spiritual. It's all spiritual. I mean, what, what is it? Spirituality is reality. So the more threads of reality you're encompassing at one time, the more spiritual your experience. The old days, they would perfect one singular thread of consciousness, like master witnesser, and call themselves high spiritual beings. But every other part of their life was a fucking mess. You know, like if you look at a lot of the best known spiritual authors and teachers out there, their personal lives, are, they'll never tell you the truth about their lives. Yeah. So they're not masters of anything other than one thing. I never wanted that. I wanted to be able to kind of be in all of it and all of me and call that an awakening experience. And, and that's just a different perspective altogether. Well, I love that because like, that is interesting because for like, I'm not sure if one of these teachers would be considered Gandhi, but like, I know he had some interesting personal issues, didn't he? I don't know much about him. Oh uh, yeah. But I like, only, I only know, I only know the Ben Kingsley version of Gandhi. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, all righty, sir. Well, this was, yeah, this is worth a thousand rewinds. This is incredible. Like, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom tools and heart. You got it, buddy. Thank you. I appreciate uh, our time together. All right, y'all. You know what to do. Make sure you leave a review on Apple Podcasts. I would really appreciate it. Make sure you subscribe. Send this to a friend. If this benefited you and it hits home, send that to someone you love. I would appreciate it. They would appreciate it. We'd all appreciate it. (laughs) All right. I appreciate y'all so much. And make sure you go learn more about Jeff. For real, go to jeffbrown.co. That's not .com, .co jeffbrown.co to learn about his books. Today we discussed only an uncommon bond, but he has five other just mind-blowing books. Make sure you go get those. Learn more about him. Follow him at Jeff Brown Soul Shaping. That's on Instagram. Thanks, y'all. Thanks for tuning in. All right, y'all. This week's Fear to Freedom story is one that has happened within the Freedom School. So usually I tell you personal one-on-one coaching clients um, about their transformations because they're so inspiring and you can apply them to your own life. But today's come comes from our own Freedom School member, which blew my mind. So let's dive into this. I'm going to read you a message that she sent me. So back when she sent me this message, this is March 22nd of 2020. So the very first message on Instagram, a DM I got from her on March 22nd. This is what she said. I'm in desperate need of your help. I struggle with not being good enough, not deserving of love and happiness. I have nothing to offer. I self-sabotage all the time. I don't know how to break this cycle of negativity and I don't want to end up alone. So as you can see from this first message, very lost. This is, this is powerful. Just lost, right? I, don't know how to break this cycle of negativity. I'm not good enough. I have nothing to offer. Very grim. So after some back and forth messaging, um, we messaged back and forth a few times. She sent me this message on March 31st. So nine days later, after some back and forth messaging, she sent me this message nine days later. Your life is perfect. Mine will never change for the better because of my circumstances. Listen, don't waste your time with me. I've accepted my life the way it is. I'll just keep doing things on my own. As much as I try to change, it just seems impossible. Okay. As you can see, still grim, no light, no possibility. As much as I try to change, it seems impossible. Don't waste your time with me. I'll never change because of my circumstances. Right? This is someone on March 22nd, March 31st, who does not believe in themselves, zero believe in them, belief in themselves. So what I'm painting this picture for you right now is the fear, right? This is the limiting beliefs. This is being stuck. This is being miserable. We are living in fear. So we messaged some more after that message and she eventually signed up for the Freedom School on April 23rd, I believe it was. So almost a month later on her own, um, she just signed up for it 
to, you know, kind of give it a chance. And so on May 27th, so you have to think only a month later after she joined the Freedom School, she sent me this message that I am going to play for you. So this is a video, but I want I want you to hear the audio from her. So remember, March 22nd, I'm in desperate need of your help. March 31st, I can't change. It seems impossible. And now, just one month later after joining the Freedom School, here's what she sent me. I had to send you a video, Ben, because of tonight, I finally looked in the mirror and said, I love you. It was emotional and incredible. And that's the first time I've ever said that. That I'm amazing, that I'm beautiful, that I'm strong, that I can do anything. Thank you, thank you, thank you again. I wouldn't be here without you. All right, y'all. How incredible is that? Um, It still blows me away that someone can go from, I have nothing to offer, no belief, living in fear, and then a month later looking in the mirror and loving herself. This is absolutely incredible. And you might be wondering, well, how did this happen? (laughs) How does someone go from that to this? And the answer is that she just opened up just a tiny bit that change is possible and she leaned into the fear because fear is a great teacher if we let it be it's teaching me more and more every day like this is a great teacher like to be honest i didn't think this kind of transformation this quickly at least was possible without like personal coaching week to week accountability exercises digging deep but she did this on her own this is amazing like i haven't seen these types of results she's like within our membership, within the Freedom School, within the group coaching, the weekly calls, the recorded workshops that she has access to. This is amazing. And I play this for you and I share this so you know that anything is possible. You heard it. You heard the messages that she sent. You heard the audio from her voice. This is evidence that you can do it too. Anyone can do it. Anyone can do it. So... Whether you believe in yourself or not, I believe in you. I love you. I know you can do it. And so I want to give you a seven-day free trial to the Freedom School, especially if you listen to the end. (laughs) So go to my website, feeling-free.com slash membership, and then claim your free trial. At seven days, you can try one of our workshops. You can go listen to the recorded um, library that we have of our past. Every single workshop, every single call that we have is recorded. And then, of course, you can join our next recorded call. So you, you listening, can ask your questions and join our amazing, loving community. So look in the description, look in the show notes, or just go to feeling-free.com slash membership to join the Freedom School. All right, y'all. Thank you so much for listening. It means the world. And if you are listening right this moment or hearing my words through your ears, you do believe in yourself. If you feel like you don't, you do because you're listening this far and you're investing in yourself. That shows a lot about you and I'm proud of you. Love you so much. Have an amazing day.